Good morning. May our hearts and minds be open to hear the word of God in the Gospel of Luke, the 10th chapter, verses 25 through 37. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asks Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him in to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. For the time that is mine, I'd like to speak from the subject, windows and mirrors. Won't you pray with me? Dear God, your word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. Speak to us, we pray. Let us hear a word from you. Allow your spirit to rest, rule, and abide with me in this preaching moment that we, your people, might hear you and not me, see you and not me. Let the words of my mouth and the very meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, for you are my strength and you are my redeemer. Amen. Amen. It is good to be with you this morning on this uh, God at the Movies series. I am grateful for the invitation. Um, I give honor uh, to, both, um, to both of your leaders, to all of the leadership that UCC Austin and to all of you, I am so grateful to be able to be present virtually, uh, knowing that our God connects us in virtual spaces. So pray with me as we consider windows and mirrors. We entered this biblical text eavesdropping on a conversation between a lawyer and Jesus. The lawyer is cross-examining Jesus in the way that was common then and is common now. He is asking a question that he believes he already knows the answer to. Teacher, he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I imagine the lawyer felt pretty proud of himself when he could answer the master teacher with the correct recitation of the law. When Jesus asked, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Can't you see this very learned and smug lawyer saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Do this, Jesus says, do this and live. This, my friends, is the key to living, loving God and with all that is within us and loving our neighbors the way we love our own selves. 
but it is as if our Lord's response goes right over his head. He can't receive this gift that Jesus has dropped on him because he has some behavior that he needs to justify. Justify the times when he hasn't been so loving, justify the behavior that is directly in conflict with what he knows to be required of him. His issue does not seem to be with loving God, but with loving one another. Is there a loophole in this law? He wonders, is there a way to excuse his behavior, something to justify his treatment of others? And in an attempt to get Jesus to co-sign on his bad behavior, he asks, who is my neighbor? And maybe we shouldn't judge him so harshly. Perhaps it is true that we can all read the same scripture and take a different meaning. We can all have the same information and arrive at different outcomes. We can and often do assign meanings that fit within what we want, that support our beliefs and our actions, much the way the debate is currently being had about the progression of COVID-19. People read the numbers differently, sometimes to justify their own behavior. But even today, all these years later, we are struggling over the same question. Who is my neighbor? Whom should I love the way I love myself? In my proclamation that Black Lives Matter, do I realize that I must love Black lives the way I love my own life? In my celebration of pride this month, am I clear that I must love LGBTQ lives like I love my own life? Are immigrants detained at the border my neighbors? If loving our neighbor is the key to living, then what must we do to live? I wonder how many of us grasp that our living, living the way Jesus suggests, living, living not merely surviving, but the fullness of this life that our Lord imagines for us comes when we love one another. We have so many other ideas about what it takes to live and live well, to, to move beyond barely surviving to abundance, more than we can ask or even think kind of living. We decide that really living requires that we go to certain schools or, or graduate from particular universities. Maybe it's living in a particular neighborhood or, or fitting in with that in crowd, you know, the ones who don't like everyone else. Or maybe it's succeeding in a chosen profession or finding the place where we can be and do anything we want to be or do. For Judy, hop the bunny, living was getting to Zootopia, where anybody could be anything they wanted to be, where they could live out their passion and joy, live into God's purposes and plans. Zootopia, this magical place where a society once divided into warring factions, prey and predator, now live in harmony, allowing space for one another to breathe, a place where there are no chance of Black Lives Matter because there is overwhelming evidence that this is true. Everybody living, everybody loving, everybody breathing. Utopia, I meant Zootopia or so Hop thinks. I mean, let's just acknowledge straight off that there are some problems with the concept of Zootopia as we superimpose this story of anthropomorphic characters on human beings. Animals are defined by their innate biological predispositions. There exists in the circle of animal life, predator and prey. Sloths are slow. Bunnies are small. There is some truth uh, to the biology of animals. Bunnies and fox and elephants and giraffes have some real life capacities and limitations. But we, my sisters and brothers, are made just a little lower than the angels. There is no hierarchy among us, no race superior, no inherent capacities that are better or worse than anyone else's. Today, though, we will use these anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic characters in Zootopia to explore the realities of dreams deferred 
and life beyond limitations. Not the real limitations of a bunny, a fox, or an elephant, but the allegorical limitations of human creatures created by systems in a society meant to establish a hierarchy of humanity, not meant to create a space where everyone can live. Our society is not the biblical idea offered by Jesus on the good life, but it is a construct so consumed with lack, where in order to get ahead, someone else has to be left behind, where there is not enough living to go around, where someone is always on top and someone else scratching from the bottom. It is the same social construct that Hop's parents have lived and probably their parents before them, a reality that has caused them to give up and exchange their God-given destinies for a settled life of complacency. A world denied the bounty of what it could be. A world where there are still firsts, right? The first bunny to be a police officer, the first black pre person to be a president in 220 years of presidents, the first black student body president of Yale in the school's 318 year history of student body presidents. Now my very good girlfriend is the first black lieutenant governor of the state of Illinois in all the lieutenant governors of the state of Illinois. And unfortunately, uh, there is still plenty of rooms for firsts, even now, because we live in a society that has determined that living is reserved for some and denied to others. And while for Hop, living in Zootopia fulfills this need to live in her, or so she imagines, for Americans today, it may be defined by access to healthcare or schools that are not separate and unequal or the ability for a 12 year old like Tamir Rice to play outside with his toy gun or eat Skittles while jamming to your favorite tunes like Trayvon Martin or to run 2.3 miles in the evening like Ahmaud Arbery or to lie peacefully in one's own bed like Breonna Taylor. And even as Brianna Taylor was living, being that essential worker, doing what she'd always wanted to do. She was denied life by one who was not acquainted with Jesus's way of living, loving God and loving others the way we love ourselves, extending to others the decencies we want extended to us. Judy Hopps, parents represent those within our society who have been told for so long that they could not live into their dreams. And so they stopped dreaming. It is the repeated messages, cuts by a thousand knives that finally dissuade one from hoping, dreaming, living. It is in this world that Judy is born and despite the messages from her parents, which probably don't just begin when she's on her way to, to Zootopia, but have been the underlying story of her life. Despite not being encouraged to dream, despite all of the messages that the desire within her was not for her, despite her never seeing anyone who looked like her do the thing she wanted most to do, Judy dreams anyway she will be the first bunny cop. This is unfortunately a well-known path for many African-American youth in our United States. It is something within though, uh, something perhaps it is the spirit of God which pushes and pulls young people despite the messaging, despite the imaging, despite the words which seem to both discourage and challenge. Uh, the message that it will be hard to reach your goal and you might want to give up before you start. And, and that's a message that can come from within a community or from without. And like for Judy's parents, they've been denied access themselves. And so why keep dreaming? And there's yet another message that says you can achieve your desires, but it will require that you work twice as hard and be twice as good as your non-Black, non-Latinx, non-First Nations counterparts. Undoubtedly, Judy has heard all of these messages. 
Perhaps it is what spurs her to be the first in her class. She surpasses everyone else just to establish that she belongs. And when she receives her dream job and her dream place smack dab in the middle of bustling Zootopia, she does not find a utopia, but the same dangerous stereotypes which demean one's humanity, stifle one's God-given gifts and talents, and denies all communities the benefits of brilliance. Can't you feel, though, her exuberance and her hope? Aren't we pulling for her as she graduates top of her class and moves forward to integrate the police department? What is it that rises up in us when her very person is ignored and when she is given meter made responsibilities in a car which will barely move? Yet fully expected to write the 100 tickets by noon, complete the task without the necessary tools, being asked to make bricks without straw. Many would fail, and many do. But Hop, with her quick bunny attributes, is able to ditch the useless car and embrace her own tools, wisdom, and refusal to be stopped. She works harder with less, but she navigates because she has grown up learning how to navigate and negotiate unfair spaces since she started to dream. And even in Zootopia, in this place that she's dreamed of, the microaggressions and bigotry keep coming, evidence of this dominant society that's had, had, that has had far too many mirrors and not nearly enough windows. Rudine Sims, a prolific writer and editor of children's literature, says that children need windows and mirrors. Windows to look outside beyond themselves to see and embrace a world that is different and to become intimately familiar with it in a way that does not then name it as deficient. Children need mirrors to see the reflections of themselves, both windows and mirrors. She offers that books, great literature provided for children, both windows and mirrors. It created that balance in the formative years. She was concerned that there was a significant number of children in our American school system who were afforded primarily mirrors. That is that when they looked into literature, they saw themselves and only themselves. They were deprived of the beauty of the other, the common stories of the other, and were left, unfortunately, with inflated understandings of themselves and distorted understandings of others. Likewise, other students who were the, in the minority at the time of her writing had windows and no mirrors. They looked into literature and saw other people and the message uh, to them was clear that even then, even in children's literature, only some lives matter. Only some lives were important enough to be written about. Children without windows and mirrors are not exposed to the totality of what it means to be human. They experience a one-sided view and a misunderstanding of the other and of themselves. Children without windows and mirrors grow up to be adults like the elephant in the clip that we just watched making assumptions that every fox is up to no good and suspect bad behavior when you see a fox walking around in daylight attempting to buy ice cream. You recall in the clip that the elephant at the cash register says to the fox, don't they have ice cream shops in your neighborhood? He is condescending, remarking that the fox probably can't read and even the bunny begins to feel for this poor fox whose child just wants to be an elephant. They are both ready to believe uh, that what the fox says is true. They are both ready to believe that the fox's child aspires to be who they are. That the fox and the fox's child would loathe their own existence so much that they cross town for ice cream and dress up like elephants because being a fox is not enough. Being a fox is deficient. And the fox, the hustler, the one who, like Judy, has learned to navigate and negotiate unfair spaces, uses their ignorance against them. The fox plays on their bias and prejudice and has been doing so since he was a child. 
It is how he has survived a world that doesn't love him, doesn't see him, and has no interest in his life. And the reality is that neither the fox, nor the bunny, nor the elephant are truly living. We need windows and mirrors so that we do not finagle loopholes in Jesus's law. Jesus answers the lawyer's question with a parable about a man who was robbed and left beaten and naked on the side of the road. A man restored by another man. A man whose behavior solidified what it meant to be a neighbor, what was required of all of us to live. And I'd like to point out what I see as really pivotal in this text that can help us understand how to live, help bunny, help the fox, help the elephant. The Samaritan, the Levite, and the priest all find this man a human on the side of the road. He is naked and left for dead. There is no indication in the biblical text that he speaks. The thought of him being left for dead surely suggests that he is barely breathing. He is naked, perhaps unconscious, in that part of the world where everyone shares the same brown hue. The only way to distinguish tribes, families, ethnic origins was by speech and by clothing. The ways they greeted one another, the cloth they wore around their bodies told the stories of who they were. This man laying on the side of the road had none of that. The Levite doesn't know if he's a fellow Levite. The priest doesn't know his status in life. All any of them know is that he is human. But it is this man from Samaria, this man who comes from the Northern Kingdom of Israel, this man who is both Jew and Gentile, who has undoubtedly had to negotiate some unfair spaces in life, who stops and cares for this human on the side of the road. This man of Samaria who is disrespected by his Jewish brothers and sisters. You remember the Samaritan woman who even questions whether Jesus would receive water from her. It is this man, this Samaritan, Samaritan man that stops and loves his stranger like he loves himself, gives to the stranger what he would want for himself. The Samaritan is a man with perhaps both windows and mirrors. And Jesus uses him to teach us what it means to love one another without regard to ethnicity, status, religion, or one's beliefs. This parable told by Jesus does not justify the lawyer's bad behavior, his improper treatment of those who are unlike himself, but it gives a blueprint to us for living. It was not an easy lesson for Hobbes to learn. Judy was ready to believe that those who were different from her could be capable of savagery. It was easy for her to assign bad behavior to DNA rather than attribute it to the systemic and intentional workings of evil. It was easy for her to assign negative attributes to those who were unlike her to rely on the same faulty evidence that had plagued her own life. Maybe she needed her fox repellent after all. But our weak justifications to misuse one another do not line up with the law of our Lord. It is counter to Christ's message on what it takes to live. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your might. Love one another as yourself. When I was studying in Ghana, I'll share this with you as I close. I saw a little message written out on a slip of paper posted on a wall in the room of a church. There was some work going on in that church. They were teaching skills, um, doing some work on microeconomics. And as a visitor to the church uh, that was modeling how to truly walk together al alongside one another, this little note tacked to the wall caught my attention and it has kept it ever since. It was an anonymous Aboriginal saying, if you have come to help me, then go home. But if you have come because your survival is tied up in my survival, then let's get together and do the work. Our survival, my sisters and brothers, 
is tied up in one another's ability to live, to truly live, not just survive. In order to fully embrace God's plans and purposes for us, we have to learn how to love one another, not uh, devaluing love, but a love that we give ourselves, nothing less, nothing more. That is how we will live. That is how we will change the world. That is how we will move from the place where we are to the place that God is calling us to. That is how we will make determinations about which statutes stay and which statutes go. That is how we will move beyond a history of white supremacy that places one life over another. Judy realized that living meant more than just being what she wanted to be. Living also meant not standing in the way of someone else being what they want to be. Living meant seeing the other, living meant loving the other, despite what we've been told, despite our lack of windows. For Hop, it took some soul searching and some time away. For her, it took divestment from the system, some regrouping and some understanding. And when she returned to Zootopia with a changed heart and a changed mind, she'd experienced some windows into a world she'd been taught to despise and fear. She decided to become a part of a world where everyone could breathe. Let us, the children of God, release the tendency to impose loopholes in our Lord's law. Let us create a world where our, our children have as many windows as they have mirrors that they learn who they are and who they can be and that they learn who others are and who they can be. Let us love our God with all of our hearts, with all of our minds, with all of our soul and all of our might. And let us love one another as we love ourselves. Amen. <laughs>